Hello, I'm Major General Bill Mormon. Shortly after the end of World War II, our Congress passed a remarkable piece of legal legislation. That legislation was the Uniform Code of Military Justice, a milestone in American jurisprudence. To help commemorate this event, we've created this video to provide a brief history of the code and to look at how the military justice system works today. To appreciate the history of the UCMJ, we have to first understand the purposes of military justice, including the role it serves in promoting the national security of the United States. In addition, it's necessary to understand why a separate system of justice exists and why its existence is essential to effective military operations. The primary purposes of the military justice system are to ensure due process of law for individual soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, while at the same time helping to maintain good order and discipline by holding military offenders accountable for their misconduct. Discipline is vital to the effectiveness of every military unit. As George Washington noted way back in 1759, discipline is the soul of an army. It makes small numbers formidable, procures success to the weak, and esteem to all. These words ring true today as well. Commanders must be able to ensure their personnel will perform their duties and follow orders, often in situations involving life and death. No real civilian parallel can be drawn to the need for a disciplined military. Civilian employers can't compel their subordinates to come to work on time, much less order them to perform some task resulting in substantial likelihood of death. The graphic nature of films such as Saving Private Ryan and The Thin Red Line reminded the American public of the true nature of combat and the impact of good order and discipline on successful combat operations. The unfortunate fact of war is that individual sacrifices must be made to accomplish military objectives. If commanders can't rely on their troops to obey and perform, and more importantly, if the troops can't rely absolutely on each other, the effectiveness of the fighting force will be undermined, and ultimately, our national interests will be imperiled. Promoting justice and preserving the need for good order and discipline in the military can only be achieved in a unique and separate system. Our nation can't simply abolish its military justice system and rely on civilian courts and existing civilian criminal law to handle misconduct committed by military members. And that's true for two reasons. First, civilian law doesn't recognize uniquely military offenses, such as desertion, absence without leave, disobedience of orders, disrespect, or dereliction of duty. Deterrence of these types of misconduct is basic to maintaining overall combat effectiveness. And secondly, a separate military justice system is required in order to provide worldwide jurisdiction over alleged misconduct of military members. We require a justice system that goes everywhere the troops go to provide uniform treatment regardless of locale or circumstances. With the exception of the current military justice system, no U.S. legal system provides such expansive coverage. Our federal criminal code, for example, is largely inapplicable outside the United States. If a separate military justice system did not exist, military members serving overseas often could only be tried in foreign courts and imprisoned in foreign jails. The Uniform Code of Military Justice and the Manual for Courts Martial, which implements it, together provide a system of justice that is capable of promptly and fairly resolving disciplinary actions anywhere in the world and across the full spectrum of military operations. In spite of its half century of existence, the UCMJ is not a static document. In the following presentation, you'll see that a constant review has permitted an orderly, incremental, and evolutionary development of military justice. As we celebrate the golden anniversary of the UCMJ, we should be proud that it promotes good order and discipline and that at the same time, it assures real, fair, and measured justice to all service members.
Hello, I'm Barry Walters. During this presentation, we'll explore what the Uniform Code of Military Justice is, how it came to be enacted, and examine some of the major improvements made to the code since its adoption in 1951. We'll conclude by comparing some of the rights and procedural safeguards enjoyed by military members with those afforded defendants under the federal civilian system. Prior to the enactment of the UCMJ, military justice in the United States remained virtually unchanged since the time of the Revolutionary War. The Army was governed by the Articles of War and the Navy by the Articles of Government for the Navy. Under those systems, commanders had almost unlimited powers and discretion to dispense justice as they saw fit. At the same time, there were few procedural safeguards to protect the rights of the soldiers and sailors who stood accused of crimes. Notably, however, the civilian criminal justice system was not much different, so there was no real effort or perceived need to improve the military system of justice. This changed, though, as the civilian justice system began to advance and progress while the military justice system did not. As early as World War I, some members of the military and Congress were calling for reform of the military justice system. American experiences in World War I and World War II were a major impetus for the proposed changes. During World War II, more than 16 million men and women served in the armed forces. There were more than 2 million courts martial, including 80,000 general courts martial. The American public was exposed to military justice on a much grander scale than at any time in the past. Many were frankly shocked at the almost summary disposition of cases, the lack of rights afforded to accused, and the perceived command influence over the system. Both the Secretary of War and the Secretary of the Navy commissioned studies which recommended significant changes. Additionally, the formation of the Department of Defense led to a perceived need for greater protections for men and women serving in the armed forces and provided an opportunity to create a uniform justice system applicable to all branches of the service. In 1948, Secretary of Defense Forrestal appointed Harvard Law Professor Edmund Morgan to head a committee responsible for drafting a new system of military justice. The result was the Uniform Code of Military Justice, otherwise known as the UCMJ, which President Truman signed into law on May 5, 1950. The code became effective on May 31, 1951, in the midst of the Korean War. What was the significance of this new system? Throughout history, there has always been the realization that strict discipline is necessary to an armed force. The UCMJ was a distinct break from the past in realizing that discipline could not be maintained without justice and fairness. Under the UCMJ, the commander retained considerable authority over his troops, but that authority was balanced with a new system of independent courts and expanded rights for service members. A new federal court was created, the Court of Military Appeals, with civilian judges responsible for overseeing the military justice system. The UCMJ provided an expanded role for lawyers, called judge advocates, gave increased responsibilities to the staff judge advocate, who would provide legal advice to commanders on military justice matters. The new code improved the court-martial process with a newly created position of law officers, a position responsible for many judge-like functions. Also under the new procedures, a service member's case was automatically reviewed by the Military Board of Review if the punishment included a punitive discharge or confinement of a year or more. If the Board of Review upheld the conviction, the member then had the right to appeal to the Civilian Court of Military Appeals. The code also provided new rights for the accused, including appointment of qualified attorneys to represent the accused in general courts martial and meaningful protections against self-incrimination. These important new rights were not even provided for in civilian criminal trials at the time. Despite vast improvements in the military justice system, many still viewed it as inferior to the civilian criminal system, as reflected in the Supreme Court's decision in O'Callaghan v. Parker. In that case, the court restricted the power of the military to subject its members to the military justice system. The Supreme Court limited the jurisdiction of courts-martial to offenses that were service-connected. 
Usually, this meant that a service member could not be tried by a military court if an American civilian court also had jurisdiction over the offense, unless the government could prove that the crime had some sort of direct relation to the member's status as a military member. Expressing skepticism about military justice, the court stated that courts martial are singularly inept in dealing with the nice subtleties of constitutional law. The military system of criminal justice did not stand still. The Military Justice Act of 1968 marked another significant change. The 1968 Act took effect on August 1, 1969, and propelled the courts toward independence from commanders. It changed boards of review to courts of review and enabled them to function as true appellate courts. The law officers responsible for conducting trials were replaced with judges who were given real judicial authority to preside over courts martial. The 1968 Act also required the appointment of qualified defense counsel and special as well as general courts martial. Finally, the Act allowed the accused the option to choose either a trial by jury or trial before a judge sitting alone. These important improvements to the UCMJ came during a time of great challenge to the United States military, as the war in Vietnam was in full swing. Another significant advance in the military justice system came in 1980, when presidential changes to the Manual for Courts Martial incorporated most of the federal rules of evidence into military justice practice by the adoption of the Military Rules of Evidence. With minor exceptions, trial practice in military courts became substantially the same as that in federal civilian criminal courts. Military members now received the same procedural safeguards and rules of evidence as did defendants in federal cases. Further improvements to the UCMJ occurred with the passage of the Military Justice Act of 1983. This act provided for the appeal of cases directly to the Supreme Court after review by the Court of Military Appeals. Prior to this change, a defendant had to collaterally attack a decision through federal district courts before appealing to the Supreme Court. The act further expanded appellate rights by allowing the Judge Advocate General of each service to set aside guilty findings and decrease the severity of sentences even in cases not otherwise entitled to review by service courts. These sweeping improvements in the military justice system did not go unnoticed. In 1987, the Supreme Court again had occasion to examine justice under the UCMJ. In the case of the United States v. Solario, the court significantly enlarged the jurisdiction of military courts. They disavowed the service connection requirement from O'Callaghan extending jurisdiction over service members without the service connection test. The practical effect of this holding is that military members are subject to the UCMJ and may be tried for violations whether the crime occurred on or off duty or on or off the military installation. All of these changes have resulted in a comprehensive justice system which protects the rights of military members. Let's take a more detailed look at the military justice system by comparing it with the federal civilian criminal system. Almost everyone has heard of Miranda rights. You hear them on TV and in the movies. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney, etc. In the civilian system, a suspect is not entitled to these rights unless he or she is in custody. This typically occurs when the suspect has been arrested. In the military system, on the other hand, it is not necessary for a military member to be arrested or apprehended for these rights, which are called Article 31 rights, to apply. Under the UCMJ, authorities must always inform a military suspect of his or her Article 31 rights. It's interesting to note that Article 31 rights, which are broader than the constitutionally required Miranda rights, were afforded to service members some 15 years before Miranda became law. In the federal civilian system, there are only two options available to handle crimes, either prosecute the individual in federal court or let them go free with no action. In the military, there are three types of courts martial a commander could choose, a general court martial, roughly equivalent to a felony trial, a special court martial, roughly equivalent to a misdemeanor trial, or a summary court martial, which is the least severe. 
A commander could also decide, after reviewing all of the facts and circumstances, that some type of action short of a trial, with the possibility of a federal conviction, is the best way to promote discipline. In that case, there are several administrative tools available to a commander, including deferring or canceling a member's promotion, demotion to a lower grade, discharge from the service, non-judicial punishments, and letters of counseling, admonition, and reprimand. All of these measures can serve to punish members for minor offenses and encourage them to change their behavior without the stain of a criminal conviction on their permanent records. One of the most significant differences in the two systems lies in the formal pretrial investigations. In the civilian system, this would be a grand jury investigation. Usually, neither the defendant nor the defendant's counsel are present at this proceeding. Consequently, the defense cannot cross-examine any witnesses or question any of the prosecution's evidence. The hearing is closed to the public and the results are often sealed. The formal pretrial investigation in the military, which is called an Article 32 investigation, is much different. The proceeding is usually open to the public. Both the accused and his or her defense counsel have the right to be present and cross-examine witnesses and question the prosecution's evidence. Furthermore, the defense is entitled to call witnesses and present other evidence on behalf of the accused to the investigating officer. Finally, the accused gets a copy of the report of investigation and recommendations for action as soon as it is completed. In the military system, an accused knows the charges he or she is suspected of committing before the formal pretrial investigation even begins. In the civilian system, on the other hand, a suspect may not find out the charges until his or her first court appearance. In the federal civilian system, suspects are either released after arrest on their own recognizance or they must post bail at their own expense. Those unable to afford bail must remain in jail pending trial. In the military, pretrial confinement is rare. Members usually remain free pending trial and no payment of bail is required. There are significant differences between the military and the civilian systems in legal representation available. In the civilian system, a defendant only receives free counsel if he or she is indigent, while free counsel is always made available to military members accused of a crime. In the civilian system, depending on location, it is not uncommon to find that the attorney assigned to represent the defendant by the public defender's office is not a criminal law specialist. The military assigns area defense counsel, attorneys who specialize in criminal defense, to represent military members. Finally, a civilian defendant, in some cases, may not meet his or her attorney until shortly before trial, whereas a military defendant receives active representation much earlier in the process. The procedural and evidentiary rules used in federal civilian and military criminal trials are substantially similar with minor differences to account for the unique military environment. Let's examine the differences. In the federal system, juries are randomly selected from the community. Both sides are given unlimited challenges for cause and multiple peremptory challenges. The military system also allows unlimited challenges for cause, but allows only one peremptory challenge. From a monetary perspective, the military system favors a defendant. In the federal civilian system, the government pays only the cost of defense witnesses if the defendant is indigent, whereas the government pays for defense witnesses for a military defendant without regard to his or her financial status. The federal system requires a unanimous verdict to convict or to acquit a defendant. If the jury cannot reach a unanimous verdict one way or the other, there is a hung jury. This means the defendant may be tried again, and the prosecutor can present new evidence at the retrial to secure a conviction. In a military trial, on the other hand, it usually takes a two-thirds vote to convict the accused. Death penalty cases require a unanimous verdict for capital offenses. If the requisite number of jurors do not vote for a guilty verdict, the defendant is acquitted. There are no hung juries and no retrials. Transcripts can cost a civilian defendant a substantial amount of money, from three to $10 per page. In the military, the accused always receives a free copy of the transcript. In the civilian federal criminal system, only death penalty cases receive an automatic appeal, and there is usually only one appellate level for other cases. 
Contrast this with the military system. All cases are automatically reviewed by the convening authority. The convening authority can decide to overturn a case or to grant clemency. The most serious cases, those in which the accused is sentenced to one year or more in jail or a punitive discharge, are automatically reviewed by service courts of criminal appeals. If military members still believe their cases were incorrectly decided for whatever reason, they can petition the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces for further review. This court is composed of all civilian judges appointed for 15-year terms. As we have seen, there are differences between the military justice system and the federal civilian criminal justice system, but on balance, the differences favor military defendants. Today, the U.S. military conducts operations in countries all over the world. Wherever military members are located, the Uniform Code of Military Justice travels with them, ensuring a disciplined fighting force, personal responsibility, and protection of an accused member's rights. Jay, we are proud to see we have a comprehensive system of justice which balances the rights of the accused with the unique demands of military service. While we haven't yet achieved a totally perfect system, military justice continues to evolve and improve. In the meantime, the UCMJ presents a fair and just system for all those over whom it applies.